just heard that coral reefs are under substantial pressure from the big three, the big three, over exploitation, pollution, and climate change. And this has resulted in a, in a loss of a lot of the megafauna, a loss of the 3D structure on reefs, and uh, these trophic cascades, these effects at different levels influence, influencing one another in, uh, in trophic webs. These bold new estimates of present and projected coral reef decline need to be met with bold new management and policy initiatives. Uh, okay. In my talk today, I want to give you a sense of the loss we're currently seeing in coral reef resources. I hope you're not looking down at your black shoes while I do this. And then provide you with some fresh ideas about how we might begin to claw back some of those losses. I shall do this by giving you executive summaries of three research vignettes each with their own implications for proactive coral reef management and policy. The first one has to do with the shifting baselines. Shifting baselines describes the tendency of people to perceive ocean life as abundant and ocean ecosystems as healthy, even though they have slowly and steadily deteriorated. You know, it's said that those who ignore the mistakes of history are doomed to repeat them. It's a truism that's usually uttered in war, but the concept is equally applicable to the battle being fought by well-meaning citizens across the world over the intelligent stewardship of natural resources that accommodates both economic viability and environmental sustainability. In Australia, where coral reefs contribute over $6 billion a year to the national economy, this is perhaps most acutely felt in the stewardship of coral reefs. So we must be careful as stewards of the coral reefs and other marine ecosystems to not judge our ecosystems on a sliding scale of decline with each new short period, short term period judged by uh, to be the new icon for pristine coral reef habitats. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of, um, of shifting baselines. The, th the first one doesn't come from uh, from coral reefs, but rather from um, uh, uh, northwestern, uh, sorry, uh, cod from the North Atlantic. Managers, have a look at this graph in the lower right, and you'll see that managers faced with declines characteristics of the mid-1970s would have rejoiced by the time the early 80s came around when stocks recovered, only to lose heart again when collapse occurred in the mid-1980s. Well, a longer-term view shows that stocks were already severely depleted compared to their historic abundances in 1850, when stocks were also surely reduced from their natural highs from centuries gone by. Another example is, uh, is our, one of our uh, favorite warm and fuzzy coral reef animals, the dugong. Dugongs are large gray mammals which spend most of their entire lives, sorry, which spend their entire lives in the sea. They may be up to three meters long, weigh 400 kilograms, they're highly migratory. They occur uh, in, in various places on the east and west coast of Australia. But they've been highly prized by humans for their food and medicinal attributes. Now, dugongs used to have fantastic abundances. Consider this quote from 1876. The immense herds which frequent these shallows appear almost fabulous. One of the fishermen in Wide Bay told the writer that a few days before, he had seen a mob which appeared to fill the water with their bodies. He computed this school or mob to be half a mile wide and from three to four miles long. Here's a lithograph of a dugong bone mount on Tudu Island from the Dumont d'Urville expedition of 1840 to the Torres Strait Island region. Dugong and turtle skulls and bones are massed in heaps or placed in rows for ceremonial purposes or merely kept to keep count of the number of animals that were caught in a single season. Look at the shape of this, of this bound of dugongs. It's actually in the shape of a dugong. And that's how many dugongs were actually killed during a single season. Now, if we think about uh, dugongs in other places like Harvey Bay in southeast Queensland, um, we have similar, similar sort of historic sightings. So there's another quote from 1876 that between three and four hours, there was a continuous stream of dugongs passing. Now, if you do some back of the envelope uh, measurements about you know, how fast a dugong swim, what's the, what's the length of the average dugong, you know, how many abreast might have been swimming on that day, uh, you get a, an estimate of about 70,000 dugong in Harvey Bay on that day when that observation was made. Now, the modern abundances I've shown you uh, over here between 1995 and 2005 
uh, are made assuming that abundances were characterized as high. Well, what is high according to dugong biologists today? High is um, less than 3.5 dugongs per square kilometer. That day, um, 150 years ago, uh, they were about 200. They numbered about 200 per square kilometer. So we've really lost our, our way here with a shifting baseline when we consider that dugong densities are high when we see three and a half of them in a square kilometer. Well, that has to do with the loss of megafauna, but what about the, uh, the, the corals on the Great Barrier Reef? Here's another example. Um, the percent cover of live corals has been greatly reduced over the last couple of decades. Uh, prior to 1980, about 60% of the Great Barrier Reef's reefs had coral cover of 50% or higher, and it's shown in that top uh, uh, blue panel. But after 2000, this number dwindled, dwindled to around 10%, with more than 50% of the reef showing less than or equal to 10% of coral cover. Well, the fact is we really have no idea of what the past variation in community structure has been on the Great Barrier Reef, and only some very recent evidence from my lab is shedding some light on this. So let's have a look at that. On the left is a core taken by divers of about of varying lengths. This one's about a meter, and shows um, we're able to core down into the sediment to try to get a look at the coral community structure uh, through time. Now, uh, th this work is being conducted on uh, near shore reefs of the Great Barrier Reef where water quality has been um, uh, implicated in, in the decline and shifts in community structure of a lot of these near shore coral reefs. And some of the early data that we're getting is supporting species, re um, very recent species replacements to ecological states that have not been previously characteristic of these G GBR nearshore sites or of these communities, at least in the past 500 years. So if one looks at um, the abundance of Acropora and Pusillopora, which is uh, of these two, the abundance uh, stops uh, and all of a sudden it's overtaken by high abundances of Pavona, a species that hadn't occurred at this particular site for the last 500 years. So uh, these data are, are quite preliminary, but I think they show that we can begin to get an understanding of the past historical state or nature of the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs uh, around the world. So based on this kind of uh, ability to go back in the past, I'd like to make the first recommendation, and that is that we can actually use ecological baselines um, to, to uh, guide us in environmental law. And, and my idea here is taken from the Superfund uh, law that was, that was, that was um, uh, signed into law by Jimmy Carter in 1980 in the United States. And what that law was all about was actually um, trying to clean up toxic waste sites uh, that were occurring in places like the Love Canal uh, in, in New York, if, anybody, uh, if that rings a bell to anybody. And what, what, what was happening is children were being born with three heads and, and 12, 12 legs, and, and, and they started trying to figure out what was going on genetically and what's going on environmentally, and they found that the PCB levels were astronomically high in the backyards of these, uh, of these neighborhoods. So what this Superfund uh, law did was it, it took money from various um, companies and corporations and industries and said, we're not going to place any blame on you. We're going to provide this service where you provide a certain amount of the income that you're raising. We won't blame you for anything, but when we find sites that need restoration, then we um, will use that money to restore those sites. So given the fact that we can find some ecological, what, what is natural, what was natural, and then we can look at deviations from that, might provide some real basis for getting at new laws for species and habitat restoration. Now I'll go to the second vignette, which is over-harvesting down the food chain, and what that has to do with marine leasehold property. Well, fishing down the food webs refers to our penchant for over-exploiting one marine resource and then moving on to the next until all that's left is smaller and smaller and less tastier and less tastier fish or other um, uh, fish and shellfish. Now, as we fish down these marine food webs, we selectively and sequentially remove first the bigger, higher trophic level fish and then move down the food chain. 
Now, last month, I, I, I spent a month in, in, in Exmouth, and, and I ate a lot of, um, or I ate some uh, local fish called ruby snapper, and I was trying to figure out what ruby snapper was. So I, I was talking to one of the fishermen, and as it turns out, ruby snapper isn't a conventional snapper. It's actually a job fish, and it's, it, 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 the, these fish were, were being taken from 270 meters uh, water depth. And when the fish used to be known as job fish, nobody in Exmouth would eat them, but when they become became known as ruby snapper, everybody started eating them. So this refers to our sort of perception of, of what we're eating. This, this has happened countless times in the Caribbean and elsewhere around the world, where once one food resource that was characteristic of a certain country or a certain region is totally exploited, then it's replaced by another. And now in Barbados, all you can buy is bait, is, is um, very small fish, less than, I say six inches, I guess 10 centimeters. Uh, that's a mixed bag. It's called a mixed bag, and it's several species. Um, and it's um, simply a far cry from what sustained these populations for, for millennia. Now, this sort of pattern is not just something that's new today. Uh, this sort of thing has been happening uh, for millennia. And we can derive uh, information about, uh, from middens on, on what people used to eat 33,000 years ago. This is from New Ireland in Papua New Guinea. And it shows that as we go from 33,000 years to 21, 14, all the way to the modern, we get a sequentially, sequential replacement of, uh, from large turbos to medium-sized neurites to smaller chitons and limpets. So this idea of fishing down the food chain is, is nothing uh, particularly new. Um, now we couple that with the, what I call the will to fish. Now fishing um, is a huge concern for marine habitats uh, worldwide, and, and we're battling against pioneer mentalities that have characterized fisheries such as these in Western Australia. This is a recently published book called Hooked for Life by one of the, the old sort of icons of, of fishing in Western Australia, uh, Ross Kuzak. And in the frontispiece of that book, he characterizes the, the mentality and the spirit of fishing uh, with, with this quote, I envy not him that eats better meat than I do, nor him that is richer or wears better clothes than I do. I envy nobody but him and him only that catches more fish than I do. So what we're facing here is, is a decline everywhere in fishing. This is taken from this uh, Myers and Worm, a uh, very famous article in 2003, where they documented uh, a decline in fish biomass all around the world. They showed a 90% uh, decline in large predatory fish worldwide. And, and what we have here is we have the tragedy of the commons. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into great detail about this slide, but what we're doing here is um, we're managing for individual optimums. Current policy is favoring individual optimums and not societal optimums. And what we need to do to avoid this tragedy is we need to manage for a shared optimum. And I, and I don't think we would get any arguments from anybody uh, on that point. Now, this leads me to my second recommendation, and that is we need, we need restoration. Um, uh, we need to get uh, the large megafauna back. We, we, need to, um, we, we need to start enlisting business. We need partnerships between businesses and environmental stakeholders. You know, in the developing world, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, a growing um, uh, sense of getting back to customary marine tenure, getting back to the, to the village level and getting back ownership of, of the marine resource. And, and, and there's a sense that this is really a promising avenue of getting back the, the marine resources that have been exploited because people have ownership over those resources. They're going to shepherd them. They're going to be good stewards. Well, why not, why not in, the, in the Western developed nations as well? Why not? What's wrong with the idea of marine leasehold property? I throw this out not because I, I'm saying I, I absolutely think we should take all the Great Barrier Reef and sell it, but I want to open up to, to debate the idea of actually being able to somehow restore these large megafauna populations uh, in some way that might benefit both business and environmental stakeholders. What about all those thousands and thousands of turtles that get eaten and never make it to, to reproductive maturity once they leave the beach? Can, could we use those in some way? Could we have half of them um, and eat um, turtle soup at some point in time, which I hear is very good, I've never had it, but, in, but then have the other half uh, released to the wild in much greater numbers than what they would have done just um, waddling off the beach? Is just one example, it's food for thought. 
Okay, let me just go to my, uh, my last vignette now. That is global trends in, um, in reef decline. And, uh, uh, and the policy that I'd like to get across here is actually reversing the trajectory of decline and using that as a measure for success in management. Uh, this is a slide that shows some work I've done uh, in Barbados looking at fossil coral reefs. This is a fancy um, analysis called Nordination. All it means is that reef coral communities of these four different ages, 104 to 220,000 years old, and how close they are in composition to one another. One pattern you might have gotten from this would be that each color would occupy a different space in this ordination, but in fact, they all, they all sort of cluster on top of one another. Essentially, for 115,000 years, coral communities looked uh, pretty much the same. Now, if you, th you, you go to the, uh, some recent data on Barbados coral communities, and you throw that data into this ordination, all these uh, points collapse to a single point. And you can see that there's a very, very large difference between the community composition that characterized those reefs for so long versus what's happening today. Now, is Barbados the only place where this is happening? No. And this is a graph that shows the, uh, the, what used to be the dominant uh, shallow water coral in the Caribbean. We've heard about it, the Elkhorn coral, and then the Staghorn coral a little bit deeper. And what we see is that in the Pleistocene and the Holocene, um, that is um, um, greater than 10,000 years ago, the percentage of Caribbean sites with um, Elkhorn coral, the dominant coral, and with, um, cervical, with um, a Staghorn coral as the dominant coral were very, very high. But something happened between the Holocene and the modern, and then what we've seen in the modern, uh, uh, this, this, this collapse between pre-1980 and post-1980, of course, is the diadema outbreak, that uh, sea urchin disease that, that Bob and Terry have mentioned previously. Well, this gets us to the question, well, what did coral reefs used to look like? What was natural? Um, I've been involved in a series of papers looking at the historical ecology uh, of coral reefs. The field of historic ecology is a very rapidly emerging field that can really illustrate to us just how dramatic the losses have been. Um, it, we combine data from paleontology, from archaeology, from historical records of uh, naturalists who used to accompany uh, sea captains um, 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 from, from the British colonial um, ships and, and other European colonial ships, and all the way to modern, um, modern uh, surveys using scuba. So we've completed studies now on a lot of different um, areas around the world. I'm just going to show you the initial study for time. Uh, 14 coral sites, seven guilds, uh, large and small predators, uh, um, lar sorry, large and small carnivores, large and small herbivores. Incidentally, the, the difference between large and small is greater than one meter uh, versus less than one meter. Uh, and then suspension feeders, corals, and seagrass. And we rank the ecosystem state of those various guilds during different um, cultural, what we called cultural periods, and there's seven of them. Now, when you go through and you, you, you collate all this data, it's about two years' work by, by uh, 15 different people uh, who are assigned, oops, I'm sorry, um, different um, places, you find that, lo and behold, we can't characterize any of our sites as pristine, right? We just can't use that word. Um, we do find that places like the Outer Great Barrier Reef and the Inner Great Barrier Reef showed, the, showed much less degradation than places like um, uh, Jamaica, which Bob described as the type specimen for a degraded reef. Now, if we take this, I want to take this graph here, again, which was, uh, and, and this is a normalized um, PCA, uh, com uh, um, sorry, principal component um, um, axis, and I want to take this graph and stand it, stand it on its head, and it's, it becomes this graph here. So this is the modern two period, the most recent period. And this is pristine down here. This is ecologically extinct. This is good. This is bad. And things used to be good in the pre-human. This is hunter-gatherer, agricultural stage, colonial occupation, colonial development. So this is basically things are going from, from good to bad to worse through time. And this is a global pattern, OK? So we do have, um, we, we do have a sense of, uh, of a, global, um, uh, a global sort of trajectory of decline here. Now, so basically, our task is to prevent 
this slippery slope to slime and to somehow restore Reese from the right-hand side of this figure uh, to the left-hand side because the, the right-hand side is very bleak. And we're not, you know, again, with reference to the first talk today, we're not asking to go back to the exact point from where we were because that will never happen. Uh, all we want to do is to uh, try to understand fundamental ecological processes, to apply knowledge of those processes to appropriate management strategies. So um, what I would say, again, mimicking some of the other speakers, we, we need to simultaneously reduce all the threats that are happening uh, to coral reefs, and we need to use this as a measure of success, reverse the trajectory of decline. Whatever action that you employ, measure it by whether it's not just maintaining the status quo or whether it's, whether it's sort of documenting incremental decline. That's not good enough. The activities that we engage in need to reverse uh, the decline. So we've heard a lot about MPAs, but really I, I think that we need more tools than just, than just MPAs and perhaps some of these, these um, uh, legal issues and some of these um, business partnerships might provide some vehicle for us to get, to get beyond MPAs and, and start doing a bit more before it's too late. Thank you very much.